Welcome back to the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. I am your host, Alex, and we are continuing with this audiobook called Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. The authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. The publisher is Productivity Press 2022. This is part eight of the audiobook, but it's chapter seven of the audiobook. So it's part eight of the audiobook on the podcast. Chapter seven, though. Chapter seven is called, Is My Organization Stuck? Chapter seven is titled, Titled, Is My Organization Stuck? And as always, there are a few quotes in the very beginning to uh, get us into the right headspace. The first of which is, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence. It is to act with yesterday's logic. And that is by Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker. A uh, renowned, uh, a renowned, what is that? Business philosopher. Uh, the second quote here is, if you want to truly understand something, Try to Change It by Kurt Lewin. If you want to truly understand something, try to change it. I'm going to say <clears throat> there's two sides to that one. It's definitely double-edged because in order, to under- in-, in order to change something, yeah, you do have to understand how it works, how it operates and in order to, uh, to approach it in the correct manner to change it sufficiently that you could even perceive a change. But just as well, you could scrap the entire thing without changing it and redoing it instead, and you will have effectively changed the circumstance. Um, So it definitely depends on how you interpret, how you understand that quote, where you might apply it differently in, in, in... at different times in your career. <clears throat> and so we begin. Our healthcare systems have certainly proven their ability to adapt over the last few years. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Yeah, I, I forget that this book was published in 2022. So, um, yeah, in the last few years, our healthcare systems have become more more systems than healthcare. Uh, However, in the fall of 2017, Peter was the program manager for a digital transformation at a large healthcare system in Virginia, and he was stressed out. The effort was failing. Workers across the healthcare system were extremely committed to the organization and the well-being of all the patients in their care, but nearly every part of the organization was resisting the transformation. We are like a cruise ship. This is in quotes. We are like a cruise ship. We know our mission, but the response time is very slow, one team member said. Worse, another team member was worried that the commitment to the mission might be hurt by the poor deployment of technology. She worried key connections might be broken by the transformation. Silos are developing and eroding the ability of employees to maintain the organizational mission. Peter leveraged the change diagnostic index discussed later in the chapter, or not in this chapter, it's just in parentheses, it says discussed more later, and discovered the organization was quite ready to adopt the change, but the leadership was mishandling the rollout. Despite commitment to the organization, the team was losing confidence in the leadership due to the pace of the change rollout. The change management that was supposed to help deploy the technology was making things worse. There appeared to be no strategy. The team asked for help outside to come in and support the technology deployment because they did not feel the leadership could handle it. Peter knew that the incredible commitment to the mission was a great starting place and that he could help people lean on that. But what else? He needed to find new approaches to change management that would support the transformation. They needed to work smarter, not harder, but instead they were spinning their wheels. This healthcare organization was stuck. 
<clears throat> just this just a side note um obviously this will have commentary so at certain points when i feel it warrants some you know i don't know some smart commentary some sharp words uh i, I might you know butt in and uh say something but up to now it's all good peter faced a common challenge he saw an organization in the middle of a transformation, but the people were struggling. In fact, they looked tired. He felt like the entire organization was stuck. Here is the organizational challenge. Like all of us, our organizations have a singular focus, survival. Whereas the survival of the individual depends on the evolution of one person, the survival of the organization depends on the evolution of of every person in the organization. Despite our increased reliance on technology as a society, we still depend on people to run most services in our organizations. This means that the pace of change in any organization only moves as fast as the slowest person, team, unit, or division can adopt the latest change. So when our transformation is not working, we are really saying, our organization is stuck. When our organization is stuck, we are really saying our people are stuck. In this chapter, we will explore, point, what is different about an organization getting stuck? Point, what are the symptoms we can look for when organization gets stuck? Went for when organizations, it's, mis, it's mistyped there. Yeah, th there will be some typos and at times some grammatical errors. And I have given this disclaimer in the past that it's not me always fucking up. Uh, it, it can be the authors uh, and or the editors who, uh, you know, maybe overlook something. It's 2022. They're trying to get content out also, okay? So I don't blame them as much and I will try to revise in real time to, to revise and adjust what I have to stop doing is stuttering, but I will try to revise and adapt and adjust in real time so that the material comes across the way, at least I believe it's meant to be. Because even, that's the thing with audiobooks. Whenever you listen to an audiobook, even on Spotify or YouTube or, or Apple, wherever you're tuning in from, it's being able to listen to the audiobook from the perspective of the narrator, but trying to distill the information that comes across and boil it down to facts and logic and objectivity. Being able to listen objectively. Because while I might be practicing, and this might be my own form of uh, speech therapy, where I can read and pronounce and enunciate and, and vocalize and intone what it is I'm reading. It is up to you, the listener, to be able to listen effectively. Listen effectively and listen efficiently. Efficaciously. Uh, points. What are the symptoms we can look for for when organizations get stuck? Points. How can we measure these symptoms? And points. What objects support people through change? And points, what does this look like across a range of organizations? <laughs> organizations are a collection of people. Therefore, if an organization is stuck, it is simply because its people are stuck. Let's reiterate how this happens. Each of us leans on tangible and intangible objects for support throughout their life. This is grounded in our intuitive brain where memory, emotion, and learning come together in a powerful way to form attachments. When we lose objects, it creates a sense of loss that causes us to get stuck. At the individual level, the feelings of being stuck reveal themselves through symptoms of attachments that we discussed in Chapter 3. Frustration, apprehension, rejection of environment, withdrawal, refusal to participate, and delayed development. And uh, just for reference, that is Part 4. That stuck the audiobook part four in the podcast. Chapter three, frustration, apprehension, rejection of environment, withdrawal, refusal to participate, and delayed development. At the organizational level, the collective participants 
come to the organization leaning on different objects for support, but we start to develop a shared understanding of support from new objects within the organization. Then when one of these objects is removed, the organization gets stuck. However, the organization has no intuitive brain where it creates a shared memory, emotion, or learning. Instead, the process is happening in each person throughout the organization. This is what makes organizational change both so interesting and so challenging. Because when an organization gets stuck, we can't look at one brain. We need to look at all the brains. At the organizational level, we can look for the symptoms too, but we have to look across people to find the organizational symptoms. These symptoms are quantifiable measures of what's going on in aggregate across the organization. Through these symptoms, we can determine not only if some people are stuck, but whether there are organizational tendencies to get stuck. These tendencies emerge through the organization's underlying interactions, engagements, and productivity. As you can see in table 7.1, organizational symptoms are directly linked to the individual symptoms we, we reviewed in chapter 3. Of course, not everyone thinks of it as being stuck. There are many different names for this concept. When we think of it negatively, some call it resistance. When we think of it positively, some call it organizational willingness or readiness. In the context of an organizational change, some will use the term change readiness. In any label, the underlying concept is the same. The people within the organization are either succeeding or struggling with their attachment behavior. Collectively, the group is either secure or demonstrating the need for additional support. The aggregate impact to the organization is an organization that demonstrates positive traits, that demonstrates positive traits for organizational effectiveness or negative traits for organizational effectiveness. If they are positive, the employees are more likely to have effective attachments, which will lead to an overall workforce that is productive and maintains high morale, high motivation, low conflict, low absenteeism, and low turnover. The inverse is also true. If the organization has a large employee base that is struggling with attachment behavior, the, sym the symptoms are more likely to reveal themselves, leading to lower productivity, morale, and motivation with higher conflict, absenteeism, and turnover. Our research demonstrates that these symptoms exist across all organizations at some level. The best time to understand these symptoms comes right before introducing an organizational change. Every organizational change will test these symptoms, as it will likely create a loss for some people in the organization. Whether it is a new strategy, a new leader, a new technology, or a new process, someone in the organization will have to give something up. Understanding the organizational symptoms before this happens is similar to understanding someone's attachment style. There is nothing right or wrong. Through understanding comes the ability to support. All right, so real quick, uh, just reading off uh, or describing to you table 7.1. Uh, it's not so much a matrix, it is more like a table and it's set up in this form of like a like a flow chart of sorts like a process chart it's titled organizational symptoms of attachment where on the left hand side in, in the very top row on the left hand side there's there's a left column and a right column and the right sorry the left column flows into the right column where like it becomes it it it, it, it equates to and this is what the top row is essentially uh, illustrating for us is the symptoms in the individual, these are going to be all the ones on the right, they flow into and equate to organizational equivalents. Symptoms in the individual in a large arrow flowing to the right, organizational equivalents. So it's literally just like a process. Like you see this in the, you see this symptom in the individual, you can expect this equivalent at the organizational level. So I'll go ahead and start reading off from the top as they pertain to the individual and then I'll let you know what they are 
uh, as far as they manifest in the organization. So you see frustration in the individual. The equivalent is a loss of productivity at the organizational level. Loss of productivity. Apprehension, or in parentheses here, anxiety. Apprehension, anxiety. Expect a loss of morale or issues with morale um, in the organizational. That's the organizational equivalent. Rejection of the environment and uh, in the individual at the organizational level equates to conflict. And yeah, that makes sense. When a person rejects the environment that they are in, you can expect conflict at the organizational level if they do not accept or are not willing to tolerate the environment they are in. Uh, withdrawal in an individual equates to turnover in an organization. And that's pretty straightforward. I mean, if somebody's withdrawing, uh, leaving, if you will, from the presence of a group, that's just a turnover. That's turnover at the organizational level where you hire, where you hire somebody and then they withdraw. It's literally, literally them resigning, literally them departing from the organization. Refusal to participate in the individual equates to absenteeism in the organization. And that makes a lot of sense. Refusal to participate leads to absenteeism. You have people who show up to work, right? And then refuse to participate. So they literally are those individuals who show up for the check only. And that's it. They, you, you won't find them in meetings. They, they don't participate or contribute. They don't go to, um, uh, biz, uh, company events. They don't go to business luncheons. Uh, don't expect them to be act an active, um, node in your note and your network. Don't expect them to be an active node in your professional network because I mean, you'd be expecting too much from someone who refuses to participate and it's hard to make them participate. You can't, you can't necessarily force one. You might be able to finesse someone to participate, if you persuade and convince them, you might be able to, I guess for lack of a better term, manipulate them. But no, as far as forcing someone to participate, if they don't themselves have that want, have that, um, have that ambition, I guess, to participate, to want to be better or to want to contribute, to want to develop and to, you know, to, to want to be a professional, you have to have someone who wants to be a professional on your team in order to have them participate. Otherwise, you're going to have absenteeism. They won't make any meetings. They'll dodge your calls. They'll dodge your texts. Uh, they, they, they won't reply to emails. They'll say they went. They all went to spam, even if they're even if it's intercompany email. <laughs> You've seen it. You've seen it. I've seen it. The last one: delayed development as a symptom in the individual equates to issues with motivation in the organization. Okay. The next section here is the change diagnostic index. In 2011, Victoria Grady and James Grady created the change diagnostic index. That's the CDI as a way to measure these symptoms across organizations. Similar to the attachment styles index we highlighted in chapter four, the tool is a survey with a series of statements wherein participants rate their agreements on a one through five scale. One is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree. Unlike the attachment styles index, the CDI is focused on elements of the organization rather than personal questions. Uh, e.g. my organization tends to support people through their work challenges. The survey started as a long questionnaire of over 50 questions, but over the years, Victoria has refined the survey and the questions to a critical set of 17 questions. Between 2011 and 2020, the tool was administered over 120 times in more than 90 organizations, surveying more than 18,000 individuals. The tool has been used in private companies, public sector agencies, and in nonprofit organizations. Often, the tool is used in times of change. In these cases, the tool works best when administered at three separate times. 
before a major change, during a major change, and after a change. Damn, I added that second major. It just goes before a major change, during a change, and after a change. My bad. In this manner, leaders are able to effectively plan for a change, monitor progress against the change effort, and then determine success at the end of the change. This accounts for multiple administrations in a single organization. The CDI assesses the full organization against the six symptoms of attachment. The tool is truly a diagnostic tool to discover which symptoms emerge within an organization. It is best used when focusing on where there may be challenges to address, not overanalyzing the data within the CDI for a single organization. Having said that, we want to share some of the data to provide a flavor of this is the what to provide a flavor of this is what it's mis it's miswritten having said that we want to share some of the data to provide a flavor of this is the case a flavor that this is the case i'm gonna say that this is the case the cdi is reported on a one to five scale for an overall rating and then a one to five scale for each of the six symptoms <clears throat> Let me reread that because I, I don't know. I stumbled a little bit. Maybe it's because the, the, previous, <laughs> the previous sentence was fucking me up. The CDI is reported on a 1 to 5 scale for an overall rating and then a 1 to 5 scale for each of the six symptoms. Over 10 years of 18,000 responses, the CDI yields the following results for organizations. The way to interpret results is that a higher number means there is a symptom that needs attention within an organization. Now remember, each symptom is reported on a 1 to 5 scale, and a higher scale indicates a symptom that may need attention. So, in most organizations, the symptoms are not presenting strong numbers that vary from the norm, roughly a 3 on the scale. The overall score across all organizations is 2.24 out of 5 which is why the numbers themselves provide little value. However, in almost every organization, individual symptoms provide some instructive guidance for the organization or even divisions within an organization when administered in a large organization. Our analysis of the total sets of 18,000 responses reveals two interesting lessons about how organizations get stuck. First, Increases in the, first two, in the first four symptoms tend to lead to increases in the last two. In table 7.2, we highlighted the first four symptoms of loss of productivity, morale, motivation, and conflict, in contrast with the last two of absenteeism and turnover. That makes sense. I mean, if you have issues, uh, if you have issues in the front four, you're definitely, they're definitely going to... Um, what, what's the term I'm looking for? Transform? No, not transform. You're definitely going to produce. That's it. Produce <laughs> symptoms in the last two. If you if you have if you have signs of loss of productivity, morale, motivation, and conflict, you will definitely see you know some type of flux in absenteeism and turnover. This is because our research demonstrates a time-bound link between the symptoms. Over time, as the first four increase, it leads to an increase in both absenteeism and turnover. In particular, there is a strong correlation between the loss of productivity and the two symptoms of absenteeism and turnover. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, feel, I feel like a loss of productivity, for me, signifies... Or, or, or for me, validates the, the concept that humans, naturally humans, I want to say both male and female, humans want to be better. They want to better themselves. They want to constantly be improving their position in life, their status, their, uh, their network, their, you know, the, their personal value of themselves, just their individual, you know, self-assessments. I got to stop saying, you know, that's another it's another little speech therapy thing, right? I gotta stop, stop saying you know. So in particular, 
the loss of productivity, when I think when productivity goes down, it's because the routine has sunk in too deep. There isn't enough learning taking place in day-to-day activity where the routine becomes monotonous, becomes monotonous and really unfulfilling where uh, employees, associates, they can become dissatisfied, unsatisfied. They feel like there is a disservice there if what they are doing in the workplace does not edify them, does not enrich them personally in their life and doesn't push them towards self-actualizing themselves as a professional. This makes sense if intuitive, intuitively too. This makes sense intuitively too. Uh, I'm, I'm reading now. I'm back to reading. This makes sense intuitively too. If you feel... This makes sense intuitively too. If you feel a loss of productivity, it may slow your willingness to engage. This in turn leads to absenteeism and the likelihood of seeking a new role. And then that becomes uh, turnover. Yeah. And that goes from absenteeism where you're slowly uh, not participating to just complete and utter withdrawal. It just becomes turnover for the organization. Second, in over 90, hold on, before the second, uh, there is a table, table 7.2, and it's titled CDI distribution from 2011 to 2020. There are two columns on this one. The first is, uh, I believe, an average. The first is an average of the overall CDI score. And and, uh, the column on the right is is that score which is the 2.24 that you seen mentioned that you heard was mentioned in the previous paragraph now the column on the left has those symptoms loss of productivity morale motivation conflict absenteeism and turnover and they all have in the column on the right their own respective cdi score uh, which when you add them up and divide by seven you get the overall CDI score, which I believe is the 2.4, 2.24. I'll go ahead and read them. I'll read them off so you can do the math yourself. I may or may not be right as far as them being an average, some kind of median or average. Uh, But uh, you can do the math yourself, I'm sure. So I will read to you the column on the left and then its corresponding CDI score on the right. And then you can fill in those blanks and do the math. So loss of productivity was 1.84. Morale was 2.74. Motivation was 2.08. Conflict was 1.99. Absenteeism was 1.76. Turnover was 1.72. Continuing. Second, in over 95% of the administration's morale is the top symptom for the organization as a whole. In the rare cases where morale is not the top issue, it is very close, with motivation winning out. One rare case was where the organization was struggling with deep conflict, leading to intense issues with productivity, motivation, and turnover. This challenge goes deeper as morale is the top symptom for 65% of the individual respondents we have encountered over the last 10 years. We know both anecdotally and through research that morale is highly correlated with leadership. The challenge of leadership in organizations is a significant driver as to why morale continues to emerge in the CDI. Yet, we also know the critical role that leadership plays in de- develop, developing and supporting people through the process of becoming unstuck. Yeah, it was developing. It was just written as develop. <clears throat> Much more on leadership later in chapter eight. Our team administers the CDI across, admi- I, think, I think it's administered. Our team administered the CDI across many industries. In particular, there are a high number of respondents in education, No, I guess it is administers because it's present tense. 
Our team administers a CDI across many industries. In particular, there are a high number of respondents in education, consulting, and healthcare organizations. Overall, we observe lower levels of attachment symptoms in educational organizations with significantly higher symptoms in consulting organizations. In consulting organizations in particular, morale is a strong area of concern. Healthcare organizations have historically sat between the educational and consulting organizations, but we have not been able to observe any data during the pandemic. When we hypothesize, we hypothesize, <laughs> when we hypothesize these symptoms might be more likely to reveal themselves. Yeah, I mean, during a time of change, like like during the, uh, the, the issues with uh, 2020. I don't know if I say pandemic or not, will I get canceled? I think I have to use like the actual viral name, but um, fuck it. The response to these, I'm, and I, I say they would get, or the authors say that they would, these symptoms would be more likely to reveal themselves because in such a time of critical change, when there's a lot of external pressures coming down on organizations and institutions, within those organizations and institutions, it's fucking fireworks, fam. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I would, I would be very interested to see those uh see that data also the response to these symptoms vary for each organization based on the leaders the results and the situation no two organizations are the same sometimes the cdi identifies the people challenges in an organization ahead of a new agenda for example a new leader within a global defense organization used the cdi to understand the landscape across his organization the survey was administered across 35 countries in both English and Spanish and coupled so the survey was administered across 35 countries in both English and Spanish and coupled with many in-depth interviews to round out the quantitative analysis. The leader considered a restructuring and realignment of the entire organization. The CDI revealed that unclear expectations across the organization was contributing to low morale. Blurred lines of responsibility were reducing motivation, and a weak organizational identity was creating conflict within the organization and with external partners. As a result, the leader did not move forward with his restructuring, but focused on reinvigorating the mission of the organization, not just the efficiency of its people. That's a fucking capable leader right there. That's a leader who, who, who's got that shit in the bag. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they aspire to restructure or they aspire to reorganize. But what they did first was get uh, a bearing, get a bearing on all the people under him. It says here 35 countries, which sounds like a fuck ton of people. And if they found a an efficient way of doing that, some kind of compartmentalized way of doing that across the organization in those multiple locations... Um, I mean, to to take a step back and recognize that a restructuring wasn't needed, but what was needed was a revitalization, a reinvigoration of the mission in order to achieve the alignment, the ultimate alignment they were striving for. I mean, that's, that's smart. That's intelligent. That's someone I wouldn't mind shaking hands with and working with. Sometimes the CDI helps identify that the people are not the challenge, but it is the technology or the solution that needs to be addressed. For example, an early use of the CDI with a pediatric practice revealed relatively good scores for all participants in the organizations, with one exception. The nurses reported a loss of productivity. They had no other attachment symptoms, but the loss of productivity was astonishingly high. The team dug in with some follow-up conversations and found that the technology was creating a significant amount of new work for them. It was literally reducing their productivity. They liked it. They were positive. It was just slowing them down. From the findings, they were able to help the development team adjust the workflows and fix the clunky solution to a more streamlined approach. In the end, what may have seemed like resistance was a technical concern easily solved within weeks. In another healthcare organization, the CDI helped identify that while the organization recognized the need to change, 
the organization lacked a shared understanding of the path forward. Overall, the organization appeared to be change ready. The only symptom of concern was morale, which was relatively low, and the other symptoms were equally low. However, the qualitative questions revealed that the team lacked common understanding of two key elements, the process for change going forward and what change solution would work for the organization. This led the research team to a different conclusion than usual. This group wasn't stuck because in their minds, a change had not started yet. But they were stuck because they weren't on the same page. That's the, that's, that's the thing. They weren't... Um, uh, they weren't, what's the term I'm looking for? Intermeshing. Yeah, they weren't intermeshing. They weren't harmonizing. So they were essentially stuck. And I'm talking like intermeshing, like how a gear works. When a gear is operating, each of the teeth, each cogs in a gear uh, intermesh with one another to effectively operate on one another. Um, and um, when that doesn't occur in the organizational level, folks are stuck. The second section, the next section here, attachment symptoms and the U.S. federal government. <laughs> Watch out. Each year, the U.S. federal government, the United States federal government, administers a survey through the Office of Personnel and Management to nearly 1.4 million federal employees to understand overall employee engagement. The survey is called the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, or FEVS. The survey has been issued biannually since 2002 and annually since 2010. There are two great features of the survey. First, because it is the entire federal government, it has a scale that is hard to attain with any other organization. Second, despite this scale, it is not really one organization. The survey includes the civilian workforce, for the 15 formal departments of the U.S. government and nearly 200 separate agencies. Each agency is a separate organization. It says here, ripe for analysis. <laughs> okay. Within this survey, we find a set of questions that closely mirror the core questions of the Change Diagnostic Index. In 2016, we began applying the CDI methodology to the FEVS data at both the micro level of the federal, sorry, at the macro, at both the macro level of the federal government and at the more uh, meso level, agency level, it says you're at the agency level. So you go macro at the federal government where like the department heads are, and then the more meso level, which is going to be agency. If they went micro, that would be individual. So that is my bad. I, uh, I read that wrong. I actually had my mouse over the A in macro. So that little arrow was fucking me up. And I said micro instead of macro. My bad. So it goes macro. That's the federal department. Mezzo is the agency and the micro would be the individual agent or the individual employee. We wanted to understand one, whether the methodology could translate easily and two, whether the approach would be instructive. The results were more than instructive. They were insightful and powerful. From 2010 to 2019, the Fed survey included more than 5 million respondents across the federal government. In total, the survey provided over 1,000 separate cases of organizations with enough sample size to review the results against the CDI metrics. We found similar but slightly different patterns across the U.S. federal government. Point. While morale is a top symptom in many agencies, it is not the top symptom across the agencies. In the government, motivation and conflict present as bigger symptoms of attachment. I think you're going to find that, yes. In bureaucracy, I think you are going to find that. Uh, that's, that's the epitome of corporate war. Morale? Are you fucking serious? Morale? I mean, it's... I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's easier to get it in the private sector than in, in, the, in the government sector. In the government sector, you first you have to uh, foment and cultivate trust, trust and integrity, and, and recognize that you work as public servants for the public. 
So when public servants from the public apply for employment positions, that recognition carries over and that honor is further magnified. So morale becomes a top symptom. Now, that's one way of putting it. Otherwise, you're just going to have motivation and conflict within departments. It's just going to be interdepartmental strife. It's corporate war, baby. That's where you have departmental politics. That's where you start, you know, have having, um, uh, you know, just motherfuckers acting unethically, whistleblowers, people come up missing and whatnot. Okay. Respondents, another point, respondents report symptoms of absenteeism and turnover more regularly in the federal government than in the other organizations we have observed. Absenteeism and turnover also includes inept politicians, inept bureaucrats in the absentee category, and then turnover, just motherfuckers who, who, who transfer laterally. If they leave one agency for another, I mean, it's still incestuous. It's still, it's still keeping it in the family. It's like when a motherfucker is in, is, is, is in the club, quote unquote, in the club, they don't have to go far to remain in the club. So they're still all working together. Like it becomes a, especially when you have um, uh, like clandestine groups operating within the federal government. So like the, the turnover could just be leaving one agency for another because, you know, you've got to infiltrate another agency to assert some kind of power um, and, and subvert the overall mission, which is over time where you get morale issues. But um that's neither here nor there. That's all bureaucratic bullshit. It's all corporate war. It's the same fucking bullshit. And in the private sector, it's just, I want to say in the private sector, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more to the point, man. It's a lot more to the point. It's less politicking, more diplomatic. I mean, in, in some instances, it's, uh, it, it could be worse, I suppose, but because supposedly, supposedly the private sector follows the law. Uh, to a certain degree, if you have enough money, you don't have to. I mean, I feel like those rules are much more malleable for federal employees because they're already they work inside of the of the legal enforcement body, if that makes any sense. So, like, they work for the team that makes the rules. So sometimes a lot of the rules get skirted. A lot of uh, a lot of the rules get bent. Leadership, another point, leadership is even more highly correlated with morale in the federal government than in our overall database, but leadership is also correlated with conflict. More in a moment, it says here. The mission, another point, the mission of the government is a major driver of attachment and associated symptoms. When something questions or triggers the mission, it can have an impact on the overall symptoms of the employees. The last point, external events have a significant impact on the attachment symptoms in the organization. Public attention, in parentheses, positive and negative, issue salience, budgeting, scandal, all impact the symptoms of the employees as well as internal change. And it's not saying it here, but that last piece, that last internal change that is influenced and impacted by the symptoms, um, that, that is influenced and impacted by the attachment symptoms, that's what leads to corporate war. The value of attachment objects. We also found that the FEVS data allows, sorry, that the FEVS data lets us test what objects people leaned on for support. Due to the wide range of questions available in the FEVS data, we were able to correlate the attachment symptoms with potential attachment objects that might be the cause of the symptoms and or possible transitional objects for people. We identified five objects through the survey that we could assess. The mission, senior leaders, direct supervisors, information, and skills. The mission is a critical component of why many employees choose a job in the U.S. federal government over the private sector. Federal employees often feel a calling for the mission-focused work they support, Across the board, we found that mission is highly correlated with morale, although not the top driver. That is still leadership. This is a critical and tangible object that 
employees attach to, similar to the psychological contract that drives behavior, attitudes, and sentiments across the government. The results clarified the different roles that leaders play in the attachment process. The FEVS survey asks questions about both senior leaders, organizational leaders, with who the respondent may not have direct interaction, and direct supervisors. The senior leaders are highly correlated with attachment symptoms of morale, but the direct supervisors are not. On the other hand, direct supervisors are highly correlated with attachment symptoms of conflict, while senior leaders are not. This makes sense intuitively that uh, it makes... I'm going to say it it makes sense intuitively that direct supervisors would have more direct control over conflict in an employee's work situation, but it is somewhat surprising that employees would so clearly look to senior leaders for support around morale. Information and skills both have an interesting role to play in the attachment process for federal employees. Both are highly correlated with morale, motivation, conflict, and turnover. Information presents a stronger correlation across all symptoms, but is strongest with conflict. When it comes to motivation, information is the strongest object to correlate with motivation. This suggests that for U.S. federal employees, having information to do their work is an important part of feeling motivated. While this finding is specific to the federal workforce, it is consistent with findings we have seen in other sectors. Mission matters. A few case studies. We know that many U.S. federal employees take jobs with the federal government to support the mission of the government, national security, public health, economic development, and much more. The government sometimes offers slightly less financial compensation but affords employees the opportunity to make an impact on these crucial items that serve the broader society. In fact, for many employees, the mission is an attachment they lean on to form a connection with their respective agency and support for the mission is highly correlated with overall morale across the federal workforce. What happens when that mission changes? For decades, children dreamed of working at NASA to go into space as part of the space shuttle program. In 2012, the program, that program ended, and it changed the approach that many NASA employees took to their work. Instead of designing the transportation of the future, NASA would be NASA would design programs with support from commercial companies. For many, this was a cataclysmic change. Others were more focused on the research in these programs and found that the research component of space exploration was all that mattered. From 2010 to 2012, what we see in NASA is an initial decline in all the symptoms, perhaps as the reality of the 2012 mission change becomes more real. Then, from 2012 to 2019, there is a consistent positive change in all the attachment styles, while morale and motivation were never that low to start. The more dramatic shifts were in conflict and turnover, which had an appreciably positive shift in the way the organization operated on a regular basis. And what correlated with the upward trend was a steady increase in support for the mission, figure 7.1. Even though the mission changed, NASA employees began to buy in to the new mission and demonstrate resilience to the new agenda for the organization. And uh, tab- table 7.1 is literally a, a a plot, not a plot graph. What's it called? A line graph? A line chart? A line chart, yes. Where the y-axis is the scores, obviously, and then the x-axis are the years from 2010 to 2019. And the scores go from... They go from 3.40 all the way up to 4.40. And uh, they plot out which which of these uh, potential attachment objects had a larger impact as far as uh, as far as NASA is concerned, as far as the 
as far as it concerns NASA in 2000, from 2010 to 2019. And again, those are senior leaders, direct supervisors, mission, information, and skills. And um, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I, I suppose in this way, the line graph was... The line graph was a, a good, I guess, a good gesture. Um, me having to describe it, I guess, it, it, it's all been an upward trend. Me describing it with, um, with direct supervisors and the mission being near the top. Because obviously, uh, you need, if we're talking about the individual level, because it was individuals who filled out this survey in order to plug in you know these indicators into the line chart your direct supervisor is going to have an even greater impact on your development than would senior leaders senior leaders were actually somewhere near the middle between what is this the the, the three the 3.75 range to the 4.0 range whereas direct supervisors and mission together they're like their lines are intertwined they're from like the 4.0 range to the 4.40 range, like the upper level of uh, like the upper range of of this line chart. Um, and, and then everything else, I feel like the senior leaders are kind of like in the middle of skills and and uh, and information. So information uh, it, it still information was somewhat low because I mean, we're talking about not entry level, but um, but lower level subordinates, lower level workers, and to them, information, whatever information comes down, they're going to operate on. Uh, that's that's effectively how how information rolls. Information rolls downhill, in, in other words. So whatever information comes down is the information that the lower level employees will act on. And then there are skills. Skills are also a great component. Skills, I think, is is the one that showed the the largest growth from 2010 to 2019 and uh that started pretty um, pretty low and then went up to like the upper mids the the upper middle of of the chart and i think because from 2010 to 2019 i feel like there's been a lot of innovation on the technological landscape where the skills to be able to use it and apply it and work with it uh to, to, to just be compatible with the modern age has become increasingly important. And for that, you need skills. You need not only technological skills, but you need people skills to be able to communicate with one another and interact with people in diverse fields who are also working uh, with, with others in diverse areas of, of work. <clears throat> Similarly, other organizations display morale and motivation increases where there is overall issue salience around the mission. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, received a significant shot in the arm during the early part of the 2010s. The agency received significant funding around the Affordable Care Act, which led to many new programs and responsibilities for the agency. The agency was charged with increasing access to healthcare via the healthcare.gov platform, but also increasing access to information for the American people. As the issue of healthcare received attention and dollars, as the issue and dollars came into CMS, yeah, as the issue of healthcare received attention and dollars came into CMS, the agency's scores increased and support for the mission increased. Uh, figure 7.2. We cannot be certain that the nation's interest in the mission via legislation and money drove the increase in morale, but there does seem to be some connection. A more complicated case of mission and attachment comes from Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. Immigration in the United States is always a controversial topic. ICE sits at the heart of the controversy as the agency charged with removing people from the U.S., who e illegally entered the country. It says here, who illegal entered the country. It's misspelled. Illegally, it's mistyped. Illegally entered the country. As the U.S. debates how to enforce the nation's laws, ICE can often be praised or condemned, depending, depending on the U.S. president's agenda. 
Barack, President Barack Obama wanted to focus enforcement on only individuals with criminal records while pursuing comprehensive immigration reform. President Donald Trump wanted to provide more funding to ICE, remove more people from the country, and build a wall along the southwest U.S. border. Both of these presidential agendas have a direct impact on how the American people felt about the immigration system and ICE. But just real quickly, just real quickly, figure 7.2. These are the attachment objects in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, that's CMS, from 2010 to 2019. Very similar in terms of mission and direct supervisors. Again, those are towards the top. And now you see now I haven't, like I said, I haven't read through this book before I do the podcast uh, before I do these the, this audiobook series, because I want to also practice reading aloud, reading aloud, pronouncing, vocalizing, verbalizing, and being able to contextualize in real time. But I can, as assuredly as I'm seeing this graph, I can tell you that I've already seen a pattern that that uh, direct supervisors and mission are going to be at the top of this line graph. Why? Because mission matters and direct supervisors are your immediate leaders. You want to have good leadership, especially when, again, these surveys are being taken or are being, what is it, are being completed by lower level employees. If we had given them to like the CEO, I mean, the CEO is probably going to say, oh, it's it's mission first, right? And then it's like, it's information, mission and information. We need to like operate the, the whole organization. And then and then he'd probably list the people. Uh, but I, I mean, that, that's, that might be one variety of CEO. I mean, there, you could get uh, a very much a scattershot when interviewing CEOs because CEOs are a different breed. CEOs are a different breed. I'll give you that. But a lot of them are going to be business-driven. Business-driven. So, yes, mission at the top. And then I'm going to say information because that's what facilitates business at the individual level for the CEO. And then it's people. To them, if they need help, they'll go get somebody. If they don't need help, all they need is a mission, all they need is information and skills. Probably skills might be a little higher up. Uh, skills has been lagging towards the bottom on, on these past three charts that we've seen. Is it three? Is it three charts? No, it's two charts. And with just two charts, I've already seen that trend. So similarly, uh, other organizations, ba 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 ba. No, not that one. Uh, we got past ice. Mm, the Feb's data shows dramatic swings in all the attachment symptoms during this ten-year period. Starting in 2012, we start to see a steep decline in the scores for ice morale, motivation, and productivity. The attachment symptoms all suggest there is a strong sense of loss emerging in the organization. The highest overall symptom in ICE is absenteeism, which is consistent across the period. When we look at the objects, we find that mission is the most significant decline, along with senior leaders, those leaders at the top of the organization. In 2016, we see that all these trends reverse. The attachment symptoms start to recover and the objects move dramatically higher. By 2018, respondents report better scores on all symptoms, and all the objects have better scores than they did in 2012, figure 7.3. For many in ICE, President Obama's agenda may have felt like a reduction of the mission for ICE officers who were focused on enforcing the immigration laws of the country. This must have created a sense of loss. On the other hand, President, President Trump's agenda more uh, President Trump's agenda likely felt more like a full-throated endorsement of the agency after a few hard years of disagreeing with the presidential agenda. So there was like that reinvigoration of mission, like we might have we might have uh, heard before. And we're looking at Figure Seven Point Three real quick, and these are the attachment objects for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. That's ICE again from 2010 to 2019. At the top, what do you know? There's direct supervisors. And then they, uh, in that paragraph, describe what the mission was, where mission would have been at the top. And it still is the top two with direct supervisors. But there's that dip. There's that dip there during the presidency years of President Obama. 
Let's see here, continuing. A noticeable and important baseline for the analysis that is that support for direct supervisors did not waver over this entire period. This demonstrates two important factors. First, the unfortunate truth that direct supervisors can only control so much, even though they are the primary contact point for so many people within an organization's daily work, there are many factors beyond their control. Second, the more hopeful reality that direct supervisors are a stabilizing force in an organization going through change and providing that sense of connection as many people feel a sense of loss to both the tangible and intangible items in their organization. That's not that hard to conclude. Um, I, I, I think even in corporate, you go to work first because you need the job, right? So you got the mission in mind of pushing the company mission forward in order to service what clients, customers, the way the corporation wants. We so have mission first and then your, your direct supervisors. That's the people you work with, the people you report to. And if they're good leaders, if those middle managers are good leaders, not just quote unquote managing chaos, if they are leading chaos, if they are creating change, if they are effectively change agents, man, you'll fucking shoot for them. You'll fucking kill for them. Bad press has an impact. Sometimes morale and motivation can be driven down by the negative attention in organization receives and organization receives. Morale and motivation can be driven down by the negative attention an organization receives. Even if the behavior has nothing to do with the mission, the attacks on the organization can drain the workforce and reveal the attachment to the organization. In 2012, the U.S. Secret Service stored in of the scored in what in 2012 the u.s secret service scored in of the scored in the fev scored in of the fev's best places to work index scored scored okay in 2012 the u.s secret service scored in the of the fev's best places to work index that doesn't make any fucking sense morale was solid and employ i'm just gonna keep reading morale was solid and employees were highly motivated by their mission with the hallmark position of presidential protection nearly eight in ten agreed the agency is successful in accomplishing in its mission and accomplishing its mission by 2015 everything had changed Morale plummeted, motivation was down, and attrition had risen 12% in just three years. What happened? It happened when there were reports that agents were propositioning prostitutes while on travel. This led to an investigation into travel practices that revealed several other incidents, including intoxication on the job and protocol failures. The most public incident happened in 2014, when a fence jumper entered the White House before being encountered by Secret Service, it was the last straw. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, brought in leadership from outside of the agency. Oh, what do you know? In short, the Secret Service received poor management and it looked like the employee base could feel it. Starting in 2014, there was a steady decline in motivation, morale, and an increase in conflict. All three continued until 2016, when new leadership was squarely entrenched. And starting in 2014, the same employee base started, the same employee base started to report a decline in support for senior leaders who were driving the organizations. Figure 7.4. Agents also seemed to feel the information sharing lagged and skills were declining over this period. All things that were later highlighted in the DHS report. But the employees of the Secret Service still stayed relatively attached to their direct supervisors, who were a likely who likely who were who were likely a source of comfort for most during these tumultuous times. Tumultuous times. So yeah, I mean, again, looking back, uh, at this figure, 7.4 attachments objects in U.S. Secret Service from 2010 to 2019. You have the mission in first now. 
the mission first, yeah, because it's the Secret Service. They have, they are literally mission first, uh, and then direct supervisors is a, is I'm gonna say a close second, and then uh, then would be senior leaders, then information, and then skills. I'm not sure why skills goes down. Maybe to me, maybe to me, as an individual reading a trend off of these charts is that I have to up my skills always. I have to up my skills always. I have to put, I have to prioritize information. All right. See, I'm just finding a way to how to, uh, how to integrate this into my personal life, into my personal and professional life. Skills need more attention because on all these tables, skills have been last. So personally, individually, skills should come first, right? Because that's how you become a more capable individual within organizations. Imagine that. So you need skills, uh, information to do that with. And that's why, in my mind, skills and information are so closely bound together. Um, just like the mission and direct supervisors are towards the top and closely bound together. Skills and information are near the bottom, but bound together. So you need skills and information and then direct supervisors. I mean, those are kind of like in the middle and, and I want to no, sorry, senior leaders, my apologies, senior leaders, not direct supervisors, senior leaders are like somewhat in the middle and they thread through. They're like, they, they weave through the, the middle of all of these line charts line graphs, which I want to say makes sense because, I mean, senior leaders kind of like are in the background. They make things run in the background. And so long as the organization isn't going to shit, I don't think senior leaders uh, will, will impact greatly what the individual does unless they, you know, um, create rules effectively like uh, an executive order of some kind, some kind of internal memo uh, passed down by senior leadership. Continuing. Quick sip. Likewise, similar trends hold in the case of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that's the USPTO, which saw significant shifts in morale, motivation, and productivity because of managerial missteps over the last decade. The USPTO implemented a work from home policy in 1997, and it started with only 18 attorneys leveraging the program. In 2011, the policy was put into hyperdrive when the organization went to universal laptops. By the end of 2011, 83% of all eligible employees were teleworking. Between 2020 and 2014, the employees reported dramatic increases in morale, motivation, productivity, and a dramatic decrease in conflict. Everything was good until, it says here, September of 2014. The Washington Post ran an article that a whistleblower had, compl had complained about the organization's telework policy and launched an investigation in 2012. The complaint became the Post's headline, quote, managers have no idea when their employees are working. <laughs> I personally don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a bad thing, but it coming from the federal government, I could see how that might be an issue. And then the Washington Post got to fucking sell papers or got to, you know, push headlines. So they're going to frame it in a way where like, oh, the, the feds got caught with their pants down. Uh, no, I think in the private sector, if a manager has no idea when their employees are working and yet the work gets done, I don't see that to be an issue in the slightest. I've been in similar situations myself before. And so long as the work you are producing is grade ace, you're good, man. You're good. All the previous gains were erased over the next three years. Morale, motivation, and productivity dropped while conflict rose and the agency saw itself in the papers and on Capitol Hill, with leaders accounting for the whistleblower's accusations. Like the case of the Secret Service, the employee base seemed to attach to their direct supervisors during this period. You'll see it in seven and figure seven five. There was a decline. There was a decline in support. It says here is. There was a decline in support for senior leaders 
and information sharing, but the direct supervisors stayed relatively constant. Again, in this case, the media attention did not seem to affect attitudes towards the mission, like the case of ICE. This seemed to be a clear failure of leadership to manage the situation and the organization. In these situations, where there is media attention, it can be a tough balancing act for leadership. There is a need for action. However, the data shows that attachment symptoms are high in these situations, meaning that the employees are struggling with a sense of loss. The employee base may not be ready for immediate change because they have already clearly suffered, but that might be exactly what is necessary. While there is often a call for heads to roll, perhaps the most prudent and important thing to think about about in these scenarios is how to balance the need for action with the need for attachment to the work at hand, the mission. Even though the bad actors may need to be punished, the good performers will still be there. They will be attached to the work and their direct supervisors. They may be ready for what's next. A quick look at figure 7.5. Let me guess. Direct supervisors and mission are toward the top. And yeah, information and skills are near the bottom. You don't say. And then senior leaders are just weaving, uh, are just weaving through. Mm. The value of transition objects. As we have seen in each of these cases, as we have seen in each of these cases, attachment objects provide... Attachment objects provide a powerful tool for support within the organization. As we have seen in the case of mission, when that intangible object is changed, that can be unsettling for an organization. On the other hand, we also see how other organizations can lean on mission when other challenges arise. Likewise, we see how some organizations could have senior leaders betray, quote unquote, the organization, though bad leadership that let down employees. Mm, hold on. I, fu I fucked that one up. Likewise, we see how some organizations could have senior leaders, quote unquote, betray the organization through bad leadership that let down the employees. While the direct supervisors provide support to the employee base to get them through the transition. In this way, these attachment objects serve as both possible sources of loss and possible transitional objects to help employees through times of loss. Each of the five objects we tested has the potential to be a powerful transitional object through a turbulent time, during a turbulent time, if leveraged the right way. The key is to consciously think about these objects, the attachment they create, and how they can be used to move the organization through their current point, as outlined in Table 7.3. So, Table 7.3, real quick. The title of it is Common Transitional Objects. The left column is for the transitional objects. The right column, uh, how do I say, explain or outlines the role of the object. There you go, outlines, because... Uh, I can't say illustrator describes. I guess you could say describes the role of the object because I'm actually describing to you table 7.3. <laughs> All right, so uh, in the transitional object column, there are senior leaders, direct supervisors, mission, information, and skills, right? And then on the right column, it's the role of each of those individual of the respective transitional objects. So I'm going to read the transitional object and then immediately after its role. And I'm going to continue through from senior leaders to direct supervisors, mission, information, and skills. So senior leaders, their role is to drive initial messaging of change and connect staff with the reason the change is required. Direct supervisors, their role is to connect staff to their personal need for change, if trusted, and have the right information to provide. The mission. The role of the mission is to create an attachment to the future state by creating an object or concept that will support the individual through the change. The role of information is to present open and honest information to stakeholders throughout the change and once change is launched, 
continue to communicate. <laughs> skills. The role of skills are to prepare all impacted employees with the right knowledge, skills, and abilities to conduct the role slash function in the future state. We know it is important to think about individual attachments. Organizational attachments add another layer of complexity to our challenge. We can identify when an organization is collectively demonstrating a sense of loss by looking at the symptoms demonstrated by the people in the organization. Many organizations go through a sense of loss when there is a change in the organization. Others happen for external reasons like issue salience. Whatever the reason, these diagnostics help us identify whether the people and in turn the organization demonstrate symptoms of loss and whether we need to develop interventions. The attachment objects and transitional objects help us identify what people lean on within the organization and what we may be able to help them leverage as they move beyond their current position and the organization becomes unstuck. So some practical exercises here in this gray box. The first one is to collect and analyze. Is your organization stuck? Question mark. To understand whether your organization is stuck, you need to assess your organization against the attachment symptoms and determine where the challenges reside. The considerations below are not the change diagnostic index. This is not a scientific tool, but it can quickly help you try to get a sense of where you might fall on attachment symptoms. Check off the boxes below, honestly it says, and see where you have the most challenges. This will help you start to think about where your organization is today. Now, think about a change you are introducing or about to introduce. What will it do to some of these areas? Will it support areas of strength or challenge areas of weakness? Might it hinder overall morale and motivation? How? Could it reduce productivity? How? What are the opportunities for conflict? Might the change lead to absenteeism or turnover? These questions in table 7.4 help should help. These questions in table 7.4 should help focus your efforts and build solutions to help your organization get unstuck. So here's table 7.4. It's called change diagnostic considerations. The left column are for symptoms, the right All right, and then Table 7.4 here is titled Change Diagnostic Considerations, where the left-hand column has the symptoms of productivity, conflict, motivation, morale, absenteeism, and turnover, and then the right-hand column has considerations, so questions you should ask in order to uh, you know, probe around for those symptoms. <clears throat> so I will read them, and uh, you can write them down. You can, you can notate them if you would like. You can answer them in your head if that's convenient, or I mean, if you could do that, if you are capable of. Let me start with productivity. Considerations for productivity is, do people in your organization tend to like the work they do? And do employees in your organization tend to think that the work they do is important? For conflict, the considerations are, do supervisors tend to listen to what employees say in the organization? And do employers within your organization effectively handle interpersonal issues with employees? For motivation, are employees given tangible opportunities to improve their skills through a variety of learning channels like online, in-person, self-paced? And do employees tend to get promotions in the organization or unit based on merit? For morale, do employees in the organization tend to have the feeling of personal accomplishment? And do supervisors know how to motivate employees in the organization to get a high level of commitment on important initiatives? For absenteeism, are employees in the organization willing to put in the extra time and energy to get the job done? And do employees tend to miss or skip work on a regular basis? 
for turnover. Do people in your organization generally recommend the organization as a good place to work for others? And has there been a high degree of turnover in the last six to nine months? Next, you want to analyze mission matters, question mark. Does the organization matter in your organization? In this chapter, we offered a few examples of where the mission drives the overall attachment to the organization. We saw the same behavior in chapter four with employees of the with employees at Genentech. Think about the mission for your organization. How do point? This is these are all bullet points and then sub bullet points. So point. How do you define the mission of your organization? Sub point. Do you define it based on the outcomes of the company? Sub point. Do you define it based on the outcomes of your customers or clients? Point. To what degree is success anchored to the mission? Sub point. Do performance metrics anchor mostly to the system? To the to the system, to the mission. Do performance metrics anchor mostly to the mission? Sub point. Do performance measures anchor? anchor mostly to financial outcomes. Point. How do different stakeholder groups respond to the mission? Subpoint. Leaders? Question mark. Subpoint. Employees? Subpoint. Potential employees? Subpoint. Customers? Subpoint. Suppliers? Subpoint. Business partners? Point. If you are going to make a major change in the organization, do you need to consider the mission? And then the final point, based on how you answered the questions above, do you think that the mission is an attachment object in your workforce? I'm going to say first and foremost, the mission ought to be the strongest attachment object in the workforce. It must. It has to. It, it absolutely must. However, and this is just Alex, the corporate cowboy speaking, there are exceptions, always exceptions to that general rule. And the exception is in specializations. So if you have a professional that comes in, you hire a professional, they are an expert in one field, in one area, and you hire exclusively, you not hire. You engage them exclusively. You contract with them solely for that purpose. To them, to that individual, that independent contractor, the mission becomes the contract. Not so much the corporate mission, not so much your personal mission, but the mission that it is embodied in the contract, the mission that is outlined in in the contract because that would be a consummate professional one who adheres to the contract and carries it out to the best of their ability that is giving the best of themselves providing the best service in turn it would be the uh, it would be well in the best interest of both parties to see to it that the company mission dovetails with the mission outlined in the contract. That's how you ensure that the work being done by an independent contractor is in line with the corporate mission. Otherwise, I mean, you're going to end up with, with good work, not good work, but you're going to end up with work done by a contractor to the letter of the contract and it may or may not fit in with your corporate mission. So, I mean, for that, you need good knowledge, good working knowledge, practical knowledge of how to draft contracts, how to draft contracts and engage with the contractor. So that way you know what exactly the contractor has been contracted for. Otherwise, they're just a regular employee. And the mission of the corporation, the mission of the organization ought to be enough it is supposed to be enough but that isn't to say maybe you know uh senior leadership is inept and if the, your direct supervisor isn't enough of a buffer 
if they aren't enough of an attachment object between senior leadership and the uh, and the lower level employee, you're just going to have a high turnover rate. You're going to have high absenteeism and high turnover. Why? Because, I mean, senior leadership could start an organization with with money, right? But if they don't have leadership ability, they could easily drive that organization into the ground. And a smart employee, a corporate cowboy, is going to capitalize on opportunities to either move the fuck up and before moving out or simply just move out. It's that simple. If you want to keep this mission not for profit, by the way, speaking of missions, if you want to keep our operation nonprofit, by all means, you can subscribe to our Patreon. That is the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. You can find us on Instagram also. You'll see a link tree there in our bio. It's Corporate Cowboys um, with a Z, actually. Corporate Cowboys with a Z, with a Z at the end. You'll see a link tree there. There are a couple of links for, you know, PayPal, Cash App. If you want to shoot us a donation, there are some links there. You're a smart cookie. You can find it. Uh, you can shoot us at one time or make it recurring. By all means, any funds that come in go towards business expenses and legal fees because you know how that goes. Um, we are, what, two chapters away from the end of this book? We have chapter 8 and chapter 9 left. Chapter 8, leading, leading a stuck organization. That sounds very interesting. And then chapter 9, unsticking the future. The future can never be stuck. And I'm assuming that there's going to be something along the lines in that chapter, chapter 9, that says that. The future cannot be stuck. You just walk in stuck to the past. And so the future sticks to you, uh, that sort of thing. But that's just me. That's just me. Uh, what is it? not pontificating what the fuck is the term just me is it pontificating just imagining yeah i think it is pontificating matter of fact let me look it up let me do you a favor right now and look that word up for you and i'll give you the definition how about that Pontificating to express one's opinions in a way considered annoyingly pompous and dogmatic. He was pontificating about art and history. Well, I'm not trying to be pompous, but dogmatic, yes, because I've got some experience in leadership. I've got some experience in being a leader and developing leaders. So... I can only imagine that if you stick to what didn't work in the past and you bring that with you in the present, the future is going to fucking stick. See, now that sounds pompous the way I'm saying it, like a fucking asshole. Is that what you wanted? You happy? <laughs> but, but then there's also uh, the, other, the other definition. It's in the Roman Catholic Church to officiate as a bishop, especially at mass. He pontificated at three Christmas masses. What a fucking pompous, dogmatic ass. Catch you next time.